Dr. Lane Norton released a video wherein he discusses the science of collagen supplementation on connective tissue, like that found around our musculature, our joints, and many other places across our body. I'm going to go through that video with you now and reassess his perspective. I'll go ahead and mention that I respect Dr. Norton as a scientist. I think that he puts out very good content that is evidence-based and well put together. However, in this instance, I'm gonna to have to disagree with his take for multiple reasons, as you'll see. Let's get into it. A little background on this. When collagen protein first got brought to the market as a supplement, I immediately was very critical of it because if you look at the amino acid profile of collagen protein, it's pretty trash for anabolism. It is literally one of the lowest, worst sources of leucine out there. Actually, it's the lowest I know of, the worst I know of. Maybe there's one that's worse, but I'm not aware of it. Why is that important? Leucine is the amino acid responsible for stimulating skeletal muscle protein synthesis. Now, I know a thing or two about leucine because I did my PhD literally on leucine. Okay, in his first points, Lane mentions that collagen is very low in an amino acid called leucine. And that's consequential because leucine is the main stimulator of protein synthesis, which is exactly what we want when we want to generate more connective tissue. Considering, as you heard, he did his dissertation on the topic, even an expert is less of an expert on the topic than he is. And predictably, well, he nails it. Leucine is a potent stimulator of mTOR by inhibiting various inhibitors of mTOR, like the protein Gator. Yes, there's a protein called Gator, and no, it doesn't eat nearby deer. mTOR then activates downstream activators of protein synthesis. Again, I'll leave the details for another time. Leucine does not appear to affect muscle mass. We do know that the leucine content of complete protein sources is a very strong predictor of the anabolic nature of that protein. All true. If you have more complete proteins, especially with a nice complement of additional leucine, there is a greater protein synthetic response, aka greater mTOR activity and thereby greater protein synthesis activation. Many people countered this and said, well, you're not taking collagen protein to improve muscle mass, you're taking it for connective tissue because it'll increase the synthesis of connective tissues and help your connective tissues. Okay, cool. We know from previous research that whey protein does not increase the rate of synthesis for connective tissue. It only increases skeletal muscle protein synthesis, which is great for skeletal muscle, but maybe some people are worried about their connective tissue and joints. Real quick here, I just wanted to open up the study that he cites, it's this one. He mentions whey protein, but the study was actually done using casein protein. So both are actually milk proteins, but they are different. But the overall point is correct. If we look at one piece of data from the study, we're looking at protein synthesis rate using labeled leucine amino acid. It's a common technique for measuring protein synthesis. You'll notice that the PRO condition, so protein only, is not higher up than the other two conditions, exercise and exercise plus protein. This indicates no advantage of consuming casein protein for connective tissue protein synthesis. Cool, just uh, wanted to show you. And many people have said anecdotally, hey, when I take collagen protein, I feel better, my joints feel better, you know, those sorts of things. So this study was the first study to assess whether or not collagen protein supplementation specifically increases the rate of connective tissue synthesis. They gave two groups of people, and it was a mix of men and women, either 30 grams of whey protein or 30 grams of collagen protein, and then looked to see what happened with muscle protein synthesis and connective tissue synthesis. Well, as expected, whey protein increased muscle protein synthesis but collagen protein really didn't. Okay, let's crack open the main study that Lane is talking about here and look at the muscle protein synthesis. So not our connective tissue yet. We can see three conditions here, whey protein, collagen, and placebo, which is an inert substance that does not contain protein of any sort. Again, Dr. Norton is right. There is an increase in muscle protein synthesis compared to placebo. But when researchers compared the collagen versus placebo, there was no effect detected. 
This next part is where I would actually start to disagree with Lane. Now, when we look at connective tissue synthesis, neither protein increased connective tissue synthesis. So whey protein was superior for skeletal muscle, neither protein increased connective tissue synthesis. All right, again, let's look at the data. Now, we're looking at connective tissue synthesis with the same conditions. There are no letters above any of the conditions to signify statistical significance, which actually corroborates what Lane says. There's no greater connective tissue synthesis with whey protein nor collagen protein. And yet, I'd like to point something out here. The comparison between the conditions showed a p-value of 0.09, meaning that it did not reach the typical cutoff of 0.05, which would normally indicate that there is a statistically significantly likely difference between conditions. 0.09 is pretty close, but not quite there. Yet, that is also based on what's known as an a priori power calculation. Now, I promise I, I won't get too much into the weeds here. But bear with me. The researchers of this study determined before the study started how many people they needed to participate in the study based on a prediction of a protein synthesis effect that they'd want to detect. This is done all the time and is exactly how statistics and science are done. However, the researchers determined that the absolute minimum number of participants needed for the study was 14 per condition, and they ended up with 15 participants. So they met their cutoff, but when you end up with a p-value that is so close to statistically significant, aka 0.09, it leads one to wonder if we are potentially missing an effect, because there aren't enough participants in the study AKA the minimum number of participants is insufficient data to detect an effect if there were one, which is a problem in science called being underpowered. Ultimately, I can't know if that's the case because we are limited to the data that we have, but it might be premature to assume that whey protein especially, but even potentially collagen is ineffective at increasing connective tissue synthesis. As it stands, the evidence points to what Lane is saying. Based on this study so far, we can say that taking collagen protein for connective tissue really doesn't seem to do much. And it, honestly, I'm not surprised. Because if you understand digestion and protein metabolism, you understand when you eat a protein, like a whey protein or a collagen protein or whatever it is, when you're eating a protein, you're eating a long chain of amino acids that have been folded up into a protein and during the process of digestion, that 3D dimensional structure of the protein gets unfolded or denatured, mostly in the stomach by stomach acid. And uh, then it starts to get chopped up by enzymes like pepsin and pepsinogen. And then when it gets to the small intestine, it's exposed to the proteases from the pancreas like trypsin and chymotrypsin. And those start chopping off all those amino acids into individual di and tripeptides. So basically what you start out with is this big globular protein that gets unfolded and chopped up into its individual amino acids. And so what you actually end up seeing in your bloodstream, what your body sees is individual amino acids. In short, Dr. Norton is right on about how proteins are, that we consume are degraded. They start out as perfectly folded proteins, then hit the stomach acid and denature. Essentially they unfold. Then different proteases, protein cleaving enzymes, are released from the pancreas that then cleave this lengthy unfolded protein into smaller chains of proteins. He then mentions that what is in the bloodstream is single amino acids, the single molecules that make up the entire protein structure. And here's where I would disagree. It's true that the majority of the time we'd think of single amino acids in the blood, but they can also be absorbed as di and tripeptides, meaning two and three amino acids still bound to one another. This study looked into that very phenomenon, and we can see, just as one example of many, that the blood contains dipeptides. In this instance, proline and glycine dipeptides. The conditions don't matter, so don't worry about analyzing this beyond seeing a rise anything above zero, because any number would indicate that they are in the blood. Ultimately, 
This is the point where Lane makes the mistake that leads into the rest of his interpretation that I disagree with, but let's hear him. Unless there is an individual amino acid in collagen protein that's stimulating connective tissue synthesis, it's unlikely that it's gonna have a big effect. And with regards to whey protein, it's high in leucine, and we do know that leucine stimulates skeletal muscle protein synthesis. So you can see that Dr. Norton's perspective is based on leucine and individual amino acids. And if there were no other mechanisms by which collagen contributes, I'd agree that looking at individual amino acids is a way to assess this. But there is more and more evidence coming out that dye and tripeptides can have non-protein synthesis direct effects. Specifically, these studies have shown that peptides can bind to a variety of cell membrane receptors, causing intracellular signaling within the cells to generate particular proteins, like collagen fibrils for connective tissue. Ultimately, this isn't proof that collagen supplementation helps our connective tissue, but it does show that looking at single amino acids is missing some of the other possible mechanisms. Also, there are some systematic reviews that indicate there is some benefit of collagen supplementation on joint health and joint pain, even if they too agree that collagen is a poor protein synthesis stimulating source. I'm going to need more time to investigate and crack open all of these studies individually before I make up my mind on the topic, but the evidence does seem to point and swing slightly more in favor of collagen supplementation than against it, as I see it. Of course, some of that may be due to different collagen sources, different timing, and so on. I'll attach my investigation to this video once it's finished. In the end, I think Dr. Norton is great, and I love the science-based nature by which he addresses all of the claims. This is vital in today's world. I may disagree with him here in the nuances, but overall, he's always put out great information. But what about this person? Are they also science-based? I'll meet you over there.